This is Retro Hammer, armor cast Baneblade and Shadow Sword, circa 1995. While Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader started out as a game supported by a range of infantry figures, vehicles were soon introduced reflecting the detailed rules for such units that were included within this iconic rulebook. Starting out with the Rhino and Land Raider plastic kits, the game established armoured vehicles as key elements within armies of a grim dark future. These two vehicles, along with the Orc Battle Wagon, filled familiar roles in the mind's eye of gamers accustomed with real-world weapons of war. Things were to soon escalate, and as originally envisaged in the game system, the long-forgotten Juggernaut, a new class of super-heavy battle tank, was about to make an appearance. Late in 1988, Games Workshop released Adeptus Titanicus, a game which introduced a colossal titans to players in a setting that rapidly grew in scope to include vehicles and infantry, firstly through articles in White Dwarf magazine, and later in the cousin box game Space Marine. Within the magazine articles, a large number of new Imperial vehicles were introduced, including the Imperial Guard Baneblade, a colossal super tank festooned with turrets and protected by heavy armour. Miniatures for these vehicles were released in parallel at the micro scale that was to become known as Epic and soon became part of the game universe. Late in 1990, the Baneblade was to be imagined at full Warhammer 40,000 scale as a complex scratch-built model. Published in White Dwarf 132, Tony Cottrell's hand-built model was a challenging project but nonetheless offered everyone a way to build, create and field this battlefield behemoth. The creation of this single model was a seminal moment in the history of 40k, opening the game up to the inclusion of truly enormous units, whether measured in terms of their in-game capability or actual model size. The next logical step in the development of the full-scale Baneblade, release of a Games Workshop designed and produced model, took an understandable turn with the decision to focus on the smallest size models and miniatures in the UK. At this point, Games Workshop's manufacturing capability was in metal casting and relatively small-scale plastic model production. Massive 28mm scaled vehicles would then have required different techniques and even materials to produce. There is a saying that things out in the USA are bigger and better, and an enterprising Californian, Mike Biassi, was about to make this a reality for the Baneblade and other large vehicles and walkers from the Epic range. Working independently, he created a number of full-side models before approaching Games Workshop with a licensing proposition that was duly accepted. Thus, Mike Biassi Studios was formed and the Baneblade went into serial production, albeit for the North American market only. This design was a faithful upscaling of the Epic scale miniatures of Adeptus Titanicus, and also set a size that was to remain essentially unchanged all the way through to the modern Games Workshop and Forge World model ranges. When released, the Baneblade was the largest Warhammer 40,000 model produced, and brought a vehicle to the field that introduced a new category of unit to 28mm wargaming. This enormous miniature was something truly new to the genre, and opened up new possibilities to the sci-fi gamer and modeler. Indeed, in time, the Baneblade and other super-heavy vehicles that followed opened up an entirely new aspect of the Warhammer 40,000 game, Apocalypse. The first of many large-scale models from Mike Biassi Studios, the Baneblade was further developed into the Shadow Sword Titan Killer and was subsequently sold under the Armcast brand. Later still, the same model went on to be produced by Forge World Models, another US-based company operating under license from Games Workshop. In the end, Armacast was perhaps a victim of its own success. Towards the end of the 1990s, Games Workshop recognised the opportunity offered by Super Heavy Vehicles and went on to establish their in-house design studio, Forge World, whom specialised in resin models, including these behemoths of the battlefield. The advent of Forge World UK brought the North American manufacturing to an end, and once the licences had expired, official production ceased and the designs were not carried forward. In a perhaps ironic later development, these Forge World kits were themselves made almost entirely obsolete by the release of a plastic Baneblade kit from Games Workshop, and these also slipped out of production within the last few years. Nonetheless, Biaz's Baneblade was the first of its breed, and today is a fascinating relic representing a decade where North American firms made the biggest, most potent war machines to march across the battlefields of the 41st millennium. And thank you very much for joining me for this episode of Retrohammer, 
where we are taking a look at this wonderful miniature uh, from about 20 or so years ago, the Armorcast Baneblade. And we're not only just looking at the Baneblade today, we are also going to look at the Shadow Sword element of the kit as well. So we'll be looking at both of these iconic Imperial super heavy vehicles. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to take you on a tour around this model and showcase it to you and you know just show you what the designs are and look at uh, the different components. I'll talk about the nature of its design and build. Um, so it's quite different to Forge World models of the present day. And then I'll finish up just by making a couple of size comparisons against other Baneblade chassis kits just to illustrate how this original model has set the size for all subsequent super heavy vehicles of this type. So yeah, quite an interesting and iconic model. So, well, without further ado, uh, let's uh, get in and have a look at this. So, here we have it, um, the Armorcast Baneblade. This is a resin kit with a few metal accessories, and we can see that the metal accessories take the form of the bolt guns on the sponsons, and then the hull turret mounted heavy bolter as well. This is the latest sort of design or version of this model, I think, or you might call it the evolved version of the Mike Biazzi um, Bane Blade, because the original take didn't have pewter accessories. I think these were probably all resin um, components as well. So we've got all the classic design features of the Imperial Bane Blade. So you've got this large boxy hull uh, with a pair of chunky track units. We've got the central armored section mounting the demolisher cannon, the heavy bolter turret, and at the time we had an even smaller um, hemispherical turret. And I believe that, that mounted a bolt gun as well. On the turret, we've got the large main gun, uh, the Bane Blade cannon. I think at this time, uh, when the model was originally created, it was a battle cannon. Modern 40K, or well, certainly as long as um, it got rules, I think at full scale 40K, this became a more formidable weapon. We have a coaxially mounted weapon, which is an auto cannon. A set of smoke dispensers on the turret, um, a turret cupola. We have the classic sponsons as well. Um, so you've got three sets of bolters on each side. I think the, this time these are bolters, these later became heavy bolters, and a pair of turret mounted last cannons. So that extra anti-armor firepower. We have a look at the rear of the vehicle. Um, again, we've got all the essentially classic design components, design features of the Bane Blade tank. It's a large hefty power pack, and we can clearly see the, uh, the armored superstructure that houses and carries a turret. This, as I said in the introduction, this is based around an upscaling of the original epic Bane Blade miniature. And I don't have one to show you, but I do remember it at the time. And yeah, I mean, it's a very faithful version of it. The amount of detailing, well, it's not greatly increased, um, but there is a bit more detail. I mean, for example, I think you know, if we look at the, um, the details on this hatch here, that's got some additional detail that you wouldn't have seen on the epic version probably this smoke dispenser as well um and maybe these fins cooling fins on the last cannons uh, and the imperial relief eagles wouldn't have been quite so prominent on the epic version and if we look underneath the model it's essentially plain on the inside however we do have these finely detailed tracks which are very nicely done and uh, i suppose one other thing is we've got Nice, uh, a fully detailed sprocket wheel and road wheels and idler wheels on either side. So definitely more detail than the Epic version, but um, certainly not the sort of uh, fine detail that you would expect on a modern forge world or indeed any forge world vehicle. But that was the style of the time. And if you put yourself back in the early 90s when this was first released, so when it was uh, released by Mike Biazzi Studios around, I think it was probably 92. Um, this would have been an absolute revelation, this kit. It would have been an incredible thing to uh, have. And even today, it's got, well, I still think it's a very nice model today. 
And if you were to look at the plastic Bane blade, well, you know, the main detailing feature on the plastic Bane blade, as we see on this, is lots of heavy riveting. So some things have not changed that much. Right, let's now take this model apart. So it, it is in several pieces and take a look at some of the closed components. So firstly, as I said, this is a hybrid model. So we've got the shadow sword element as well, which we're going to take a look at shortly. But I'll just show you how that works because the whole of the upper hull lifts away like that. I'm building this for a client and as you can see, I've put in a few magnets to hold that in place. So those aren't, um, those have been added later. Now, having done that, before we look at the details, here's a, an interesting bit of the history. So here it says, Armorcast, copyright 1990 Games Workshop Limited. Did I say 92? I think it might be 91 that um, Mike uh, Biazzi first released his models. He formed Armorcast with another guy uh, in 1995. So this, so we've got the original licensing agreement there in 1990, but Armorcast was came onto the scene a bit later on, and it is a bit of a, um, a fascinating story as to the whole Armorcast and uh, other resin model production skills. They did a lot. I mean, they did Reaver Titans, Warhound Titans, and even all the way up to a very large Eldar Phantom Titan. Um, in terms of a history, I do recommend that you check it out. And I'll leave a link to an article in the description where I actually researched and found out most of the history about this. Because I, as a European guy, or British, uh, quite unfamiliar with Armorcast. Um, because as as I said, it was only licensed by Games Workshop for sale in North America. So if you were in the USA or Canada, you'd have probably been able to buy these. Or you would have been able to buy these. Um, but not retail in Europe. So, a little aside there, remove the turret, and I'll just move that out of the way. So in terms of a turret, classic Bane blade turret, I mean, this turret became larger in the following models, but this was very faithful to the original Epic design. And I do like it, and it's got lots of nice, real world style features. You know, you've got like an observation port, a nice, large Aquila, some viewports, a stowage bin, an escape hatch, or maybe an ammunition loading hatch, a uh, commander's cupola, and a rather nicely detailed smoke dispenser, which I do really like. We have the large battle cannon, which is, uh, you know, this I've not hauled this out, this is how it was cast, and then a coaxially mounted auto cannon, if I remember rightly. And then it's got yeah, like your classic sort of um, notches for mounting it on the hull. Uh, that was broken off, so I've just done a little bit of a restoration repair there using some modern forge old work resin. So yeah, there's a there's a little little bits of modern resin in this model, and we'll come back to that at the end actually because it's quite funny. So that's the turret, and then we have the hull deck or the upper hull. Loads of details here. Got the micro bolter turret that was removed on the later versions, the iconic demolisher cannon, another impressive Aquila, the heavy bolter mounted in the turret, um, another crew hatch, some more vision ports, and perhaps a ventilation grate, um, an access hatch there. As you can see, um, it's not hugely detailed by modern standards, but nonetheless, it's nicely done. Uh, all the details are very well defined, very chunky. And with a nice paint scheme, this is going to look absolutely brilliant. And you know, if you imagine do some airbrushing work on this, this, is, this could be really special. So there we go. So that's the upper hull. Now let's take a look at the lower hull and we will then move on to the shadow sword element of this kit. So lower hull, let's start with these two. So the two last cannons are removable. Got some nice detailing on these. Again, it's chunky detailing, although these around here, this is a bit finer. Uh, and then we've got these embossed Aquila or Aquilas on either side of the 
uh, hexagonal turrets and they've got the same sort of notch uh, mounting mechanism and then the actual hull itself so it's got these uh, twin headlights up front very uh, distinctive for the Bane blade again we've got the armor cast stamp there so this shows this is one of the 1995 onward production versions of this model so looking around the side I mean big chunky details we've got the prominent we've got nicely defined armor uh, plate so these will all uh, pick out very well when they're painted and these huge hefty rivets a pair of um, supports there on the sponson which is quite blocky it's quite simple just got some chamfered edges on the armor got these three bolters I'm sure they were bolters originally as opposed to heavy bolters um, they became a twin linked heavy bolter later on um, that's with the actual forge world proper or forge world UK release of the model and then the road wheels there's not a lot of parts to this kit as you can probably imagine I mean there's one two three four five and then I think the tracks are separate as well when I got this model the tracks were all assembled I've found a few archive photos and I think each track section is cast as a single piece uh, so much simpler production than modern forge all kits and certainly the um, original forge all bane blade this whole track construction is quite a complicated affair and then, yeah similar thing on the other side I mean there's a few extra details like there's a panel here um, a vent here or an intake and a couple of equipment storage boxes on the rear of the track guards and then we've got a hefty exhaust unit on the rear very um, typically well very Bane blade style very imperial vehicle style um, but again around the back very simple plain no detailing on the underside right so that is the, ba the main kit so this was the original as far as I understand it the original Biazzi kit and where it all really started now what came along a bit later well this came along a bit later we got a shadow sword modification kit so this again same sort of drill and just to show you once again we've got the armor cast um, identifier there same as the other two and this sculpt is based on the well the same epic range model as the Bane Blade was. I I do remember my epic shadow sword from the day very well. I painted it up in ultramarine colours, one of the few ultramarine things I've ever painted. And yeah, this is very faithful to it. Again, chunky detailing. Now to take a look at it, I've magnetized this for the client to make it easier to transport. So we'll just take that out and then we can have a look at the hull and then we can have a look at the volcano cannon or what was originally called the defense laser so we've got panel another large aquila very good and another bolt gun detail there that's a weapon mount got lots of um, ports or vision ports located around the armored citadel but again like the Bane blade the detailing is chunky well defined but not particularly copious in quantity got um, a commander's cupola there a few other bits like a little uh, uh, a little vision port there and then we have the secondary weapon turret here now you'll have already noticed that this is a modified piece now the reason for this is the original resin part that was here which is kind of was quite a crudely shaped bolt gun was broken so what I've done for the client is I've used a bolt gun from the RTB01 plastic box set uh, to rebuild it and then also or recreate the weapon. And I thought, given the age of the kit, this is a nice little authentic addition um, to as a way of repairing that missing part. And then the ammunition box feed, I've just built that out of a couple of bits of resin. There's two bits of forge old resin here, and the center is actually, believe it or not, a piece of fine cast. So within this model, you have all three resin mediums at Games Workshop models have ever been officially made in. Armor cast resin, forge old resin, 
and Finecast. So there you go. And uh, in there you can see where the magnet is uh, that I'm mounted and that I, I fitted that in place with some nice strong epoxy glue to hold it. All right, let's put in, well, let's look at first. So this is a defense laser. Again, big chunky tube design, nice cast open barrel, do like that. And then the gun mantlet as well, if you cannot drop it, and there's magnet. And then this just pushes in there like that. And there you go. So let's, again, we've got some magnets there just to hold it nice in place. And that drops in there. And yeah, what a fantastic model. Now, for me, um, this is actually my favorite of the two. I always like the original Shadow Sword design. Out of the last cannons as well while we're at it. Or, as it was strictly called, if I remember rightly, this was called the Falchion, uh, the Falchion Titan Hunter. And it was armed with a defense laser, two last cannons, and then a few supporting bolters. But yeah, that just sits in there like that. Yeah, it looks great. And what a clever use of the model um, to be able to build it this way. I'm not quite sure as to the provenance of this model, as to how the design evolved. Um, it looks like um, it was built this way with the lift out center hull from the word go. And I wonder if that is the case. I wonder if you know Biazzi was looking ahead to say, well, I'll do one hull and then I can drop a number of superstructures in to make it as different vehicles. And I think, I don't know if we ever sold any other variants on this. I've seen pictures of prototypes, which um, are also in the articles that I'll link detailing some of the history to Armacast and Biazzi Studios. So do, uh, yeah, have a look at those. There's some fascinating prototypes in there. Mm. Great looking model though, really is. And the other two, the Falchion stroke Shadow Sword version is certainly for my tastes is my favorite but you know that's courses for horses in terms of the models they are both equally good in terms of their styling and detailing and how faithfully they reproduce the original epic models so yeah a wonderful model really really nice let's now talk a little bit about the let's call it let's say the practical side of um, armor cast models in terms of what it's actually cast out of. Now these are cast out of a resin, quite unlike anything that is used today by Games Workshop, Forge, or, or indeed any other model manufacturer that I'm um, familiar with on resin. I don't know the name of the resin compound that's used, um, but if anyone was into military modeling back in the early 90s and if you remember a company called the Linden, who were known for making resin accessories for 1 to 35th scale military modeling it is cast out of the same material so it's quite unlike anything that you would buy a modeling today and that's probably just as well really because there are some drawbacks with this material i suppose the first is in terms of if we look at some of the casting now i've spent a long time restoring filling cleaning this up um, you can see there's lots of milli putting here and this is where I'd filled lots of little air bubbles um, that I'd collected from when it was cast like so. If we look at the rear of the hull this whole section here was very crudely finished um, out of the moulds there were some enormous mould slips lots of air bubbles and what have you so I've taken my favorite filler, Milliput, and I've rebuilt the form and shape um, there, like so. So for, a, you know, for a, an accomplished modeler, that's a fine, you know, something you can do, but certainly not the easiest thing um, for a beginner to do. But these were certainly never aimed at beginner modelers, I don't think. There is that issue with the resin. I mean, in terms of working with it, in terms of filing it and knife work and cutting it, it's fine. It's probably, it's not as nice to work with as forge walled resin. Or indeed other, uh, most other resins today. It does have a sort of chalky brittleness to it. Well, it's not particularly brittle, but it is a bit chalky. 
So it's not quite as easy to work with. The real thing that stands out to me having worked on these extensively is the smell. By goodness me, this resin is very pongy. Um, bearing in mind that this model is probably in the region of 20 years old, it still absolutely stinks. And if I pick this up, yeah, sniff it, go dreadful. It smells like hydrocarbon halitosis. That's the best way I can verbalize the smell. And from just handling the model now, if I smell both of my hands, I can, I can smell the resin on them. Um, I don't understand the chemistry behind it, but yes, it is whiffy. And when I was working on the model and doing uh, even wet sanding and just cutting it, the odor that built up in the room was quite unbearable at times. Uh, and I had to work with lots of windows and doors open to keep the air flowing. So yeah, I think it's a good thing that other resins are used today, but you know, it is what it is and it's a product of the time. So I don't think we can take anything away from it in that context. However, if you were to go and get hold of one of these models, it is something worth considering and I wouldn't display them like this um, because they smell so much. If I were to, you know, you really want to get them primed or covered or sealed just to stop the smell, I think. Um, so something to bear in mind there. So what else is there to say about these? I mean, I've touched on a bit with the introduction. Now, from the article I read, I, I think I pieced together the history of these models. And as I say, Mike Biazzi approached Games Workshop with a licensing proposition in 1990, which was granted. And I believe he started selling the Baneblade kit original ones it's sometime in 1991. Come 1995 he then jointly established a new company or him and another guy and I forget his name I'll put his name on the screen somewhere around here but apologies I forgot your name but I'll put it there um, a joint venture which became Armacast and that I think was probably a bigger operation I get this feel um, and they went on to sell and make more of these models. Then another company in North America approached Games Workshop and were granted a license to produce um, Mike Biazzi models. They also did some of their own um, under license. So you had these models produced by what was called Forge World models. Now that is not to be confused with the modern Forge World. They are two separate entities. So Games were, when Games Workshop created Forge World in the late 90s, they actually in effect poached that name Forge World models or the Forge World part of it. Well, you can't say poach because, of course, you can't copyright or trademark Forge World. It's too common in language. It seems to me that that is the origin of the name of Forge World. It was the American company Forge World Models that produces under license um, that Games Workshop UK took and when, and when it was established, which I think was Tony Cottrell's Enterprise, uh, that was where the name came from certainly seems that way to me. Maybe I'm wrong. If you know the history, please do uh, share that down below. I'll be very interested to hear. So I guess there's all sorts of different variants of this kit floating around. There'll be Mike Biazzi Studios, the original ones. There'll be Armicast, like these two. And then there'll be Forge World Models versions as well. Um, I don't know what either of those ones, apart from these, look like. So there were a fair few manufacturers who made these, which is quite unlike what we're used to as buyers of Games Workshop models because they all come out of Games Workshop with no licensed production, but these are an exception. Okay, so to finish on, I just want to make a couple of size comparisons against other versions of the Bane Blade. And the reason I want to do this is to illustrate that when Mike Biazzi made his original design, he essentially got the size spot on and it's changed, really, it's changed very little in the intervening years. So you stay there a moment. Right, so what I've ne got next is a, a, another project that I've got on the go. I'll have to move you out of the way. Um, for those of you who watched my how to freeze and break super glue video, you will recognize this. This is the Forge World Bane Blade. So this is a kit that came onto the scene in about 1999, 2000, and this was in effect, the, one of Forge World UK's first products. And this basically supplanted this design. So this was the one that in licensed production took over from this. 
So as you can see, it's not built at the moment and this is going to be a long and slow restoration project with lots to do. But what I do want to show is the similarity in size and as you can see side by side they do look very similar. Clearly um, the turret did get a bit bigger but not that much bigger. I mean I, I guess it's a, it's a bit longer in the rear and it's got this larger um, equipment bin or stowage bin but you know not a great deal of change really um, when all things considered I mean obviously the gun mantlets very uh, much much more sophisticatedly detailed on this one but yeah close similarity there and size wise I mean when this is on its tracks it's probably going to sit there so it's the same sort of height and width wise this one is a bit wider. I mean, obviously you've got the perspective of the camera there, but it's probably about a centimeter wider, um, excluding the sponsor. So yeah, it's a little bit wider, but not a great deal. And then lengthwise, if we match them up in terms of the whole sponsor, so you know this track unit, again, you can't quite see it because of the perspective, but if I take that away, you probably can a bit better. The two are, well, as to my eye, give or take the odd millimetre, they are the same length. Now, the Forge World UK model ended up larger because they bulked out the rear, uh, the power pack and the exhaust unit compared to the armor cast variant. But I guess what I'm saying there is this armor cast model very much set the size of the Imperial Baneblade chassis tanks from the word go. And if we look through to the modern iterations of the model, we can see this carrying through there. Now, I've got here the fell blade. So this is a modern forge old kit, and I thought we could just look at the size. Now, the fell blade is larger than a bane blade, so uh, do bear that in mind. But what I want to look at here, I suppose, is the underpinning plastic components. We move the turret. As you probably gathered, I haven't got a plastic bane blade to do a one for one comparison here. You can flip it over. I have to take some bits away. A little bit clumsy here. There we go. And then if we look at them on the underside, if I line up the ends of the hulls, well, they're not that far apart. The This one is maybe, including the power pack, it's maybe about one and a half centimeters longer in the hull. The tracks do extend out a bit further at the front. Um, so overall, this one is probably around three centimeters longer than the original. And probably width-wise, is it wider? Uh, well, actually this forge wall, the current generation one, width-wise, is probably, yeah, about the same as, maybe a bit narrower than the um, 1999 2000 forge wall one I showed you so yes width wise it's yeah you know, it's not a million miles away is a bit tall though but I just thought it'd be interesting to make the comparison there with the original Biazzi armor cast bane blade and well a current modern version So there is a little bit of a change in size, but all things considered, this original version got it pretty much right on the size front, and it hasn't changed much since then. So this is a really fascinating model, this, for a whole host of reasons. I mean, uh, it, it's clearly, it's a retro design. It's based on the original Epic miniatures, which I find really interesting in itself. But I think what is equally if not more so interesting in some regards is what it represents from the point of view of the evolution of the 40k miniature line and this unusual let's say detour or, or perhaps well not design cul-de-sac but detour into licensed production from an independent company that this you know that this model is and i do wonder if it was might be as his model that ultimately sort of pave the way for the creation of the modern forge world because 
I guess what these what what his enterprises showed that there was a market for these big, you know, impressive, you know, serious model kits. You know, not not they're not necessarily aimed at the same sort of market as most games workshop miniatures are. I mean, I, I think they're certainly aimed at a more experienced modeler, but they show that there was a real market and demand for this type of miniature. And I do wonder if it was the model that games workshop then decided to go with and say, we can do our own thing. We can create our own resin manufacturing company. And you know, that materialized in the form of forge wall. So yeah, a really interesting bit of 40k history. And when we think of a modern game as well, super heavy vehicles have become a huge part of the game. Um, you know, certainly at the time, Games Workshop's best selling kit they'd ever done was the Imperial Knight. And the Imperial Knight, of course, is a super heavy. And it does make me think that, you know, it goes back to models like this that first showed that they could be made and there was a market out there to sell them. And of course, the modern forge wall has become a colossal enterprise in its own right. And, you know, when you look at the largest models that it produces, such as the uh, Warlord Titan and the Tau Manta. And, you know, it does show how extraordinary that side of the hobby has become. So in that regard, for me, um, this model has perhaps something you could look at as being like a bit of a Genesis model, you know, where it all began. I hope you have enjoyed this latest episode of Retro Hammer, taking a look at this fascinating example of the Armorcast Baneblade. I'd just like to thank the owner of this model for allowing me to use it in this uh, video. It will be going back to be united with him soon, so I do hope he's happy with the work I've done. I'd also like to thank all of my patrons for their ongoing support. Things have been very busy in my life and are going to continue to be very busy in my life for perhaps another half year, which makes it a bit difficult for me to produce videos of you know, retro hammer videos and do it right like I like to do like this one. So um, I am very grateful for your support and also your patience. Um, there will be more retro hammer videos to come, rest assured. And thank you all again. So I think all that leaves me to say is I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please do share your thoughts and observations on this model. If you've got any experience or knowledge of Armorcast, I'll be really interested to hear about it. As I said, I've done my research from an article that I read. If you notice I've got something wrong, please do um, share that information with everybody in the comments section. If you know something new that I didn't talk about with regards to Mike Biazzi, Armorcast, and Forge or models, well, please do share that as well. It'd be really interesting to hear those observations. That was Retro Hammer. Thank you for watching and goodbye.